Shall we rise up to pray? Our God in heaven, we thank you very much for the Bible study of today. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be present in your, in your presence. Lord, we pray that today you open our eyes to see great, wondrous things out of your word in Jesus' name. For all those who are meeting with us here and all over this city, in our headquarters church, and all over this nation, and outside this nation, and those who will be hearing the message later on the internet, Lord, we pray. You help us to see what you want us to see and to prepare to meet our God that Lord will be interested in what you are interested in. Will desire what you desire and Lord, this spiritual life you grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. Help us Lord not to play religion. Help us, Lord, to be very sincere and to be honest with you. And then to seek the face of the Lord and be who he wants us to be. And do what he wants us to do in the way he wants us to do it. Lord, we pray that you help us to live this righteous, pure, holy, unblemished, unselfish life. That, Lord, when, the Lord, when you will come, we'll be able to see your face without shame without regret because your grace has helped us to live according to your word your word says man look at on the outward on the outside part of man but you look on the heart and therefore lord we pray that what's important to you, our heart our thoughts our desires our imagination our motive our intention lord we pray you purify everything so that from within will be holy and righteous and then outside the outside will reflect what has happened inside be with us as we study your word today in jesus name we pray thank you very much you can sit down i welcome you to the bible study tonight and i welcome you back to the sermon on the mount we have studied already chapter 5 verses 1 through to 48 and now we come to chapter 6. I want to remind you as we've been studying from chapter 5. And then you look at verse 20. It says, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Here is the king. And he's talking to us as a king. In Matthew, you have the king. In chapter 1, the king is revealed. And then in chapter 2, you have the king already resisted. Because you see, Herod wanted to kill the king. And then you have the king rejected by the whole nation. And then eventually now you have the king. And he's telling us the responsibilities of the kingdom. Of the kingdom citizens. And that's why he tells us in Matthew chapter 5. It says, if you're going to be in the kingdom. This is the declaration of the king. And then he says, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. That already implies the Pharisees and the scribes, although they were religious, they were not citizens of the kingdom. If anybody is going to be in the kingdom and stay in the kingdom and remain in the kingdom, he must have his righteousness exceeding, going beyond, higher and deeper, broader and greater than the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. What's the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? External righteousness. And you see that limit because in verses 21 to 48, it begins to tell us the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Thou shalt not murder. That's where it is taught. But I tell you, you not even get angry with your brother. And if you're angry with your brother, you go to reconcile with him. When you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember. That your brother has ought against you. If your righteousness is going to be greater than the right than the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees, you'll not just go ahead offering any kind of offering. You reconcile therein is righteousness, exceeding, going beyond the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And then he said, You have heard that shall not commit adultery. And the Pharisees only limited that to external affair. 
which is what many people say today. They will say, I didn't go into the real art. That's, you're still guilty because Jesus Christ said, if you look on a woman to lust after her in your heart, you see it's a matter of the heart. We say, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. That if you look on a woman to lost her time in your heart, you have committed adultery with her already in your heart. You are guilty in the sight of the Lord. You must be cleansed. You must be converted. There must be a change if you are going to be in the kingdom. And then it says you have heard that when you want to put away your wife for any reason, all you have to do is to give a right to your divorce me, but I say unto you that you stay together because in the beginning, he made them male and female. And for this cause he said, Man shall leave father and mother and shall cleave together. They shall join together what God has put together. Let no man put asunder. And then he says, Have you not heard? You'll forswear yourself. Or thou shalt not forswear thyself, but perform thine oath unto the Lord. But I say unto you, swear not at all. Not when you are playing, not when you are joking, not when you are serious. Any time. In the court, or in your home, with your friend, anywhere, swear not at all. Not by Jerusalem, not by the earth, not by heaven, not by the throne of God. And then it says, have you not heard an eye for an eye? And it's two for a two, a two. Retaliation, the principle of the world, the action of the world, the practice of the world. Hit him, he hits you. Touch him, he touches you. Insult him, he will insult you back. Eye for eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, here is the righteous standard of the kingdom. You see, getting into the kingdom of God is not child's play. Getting into the kingdom of God is not just, you know, you just come to church and read the Bible and live anyhow without conversion, without salvation, without righteousness, without sanctification, without holiness, and then just find yourself in heaven. It doesn't happen that way. It says if you're going to get there, your righteousness must be higher and deeper. Than the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And therefore he says, he tells us very clearly that he receives not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now you have heard, it has been said, you love your neighbor you love your neighbor and then you hate your enemy he says no no that's how the pharisees are prayed that's how the scribes are prayed that's why the door of the kingdom is shut against them but i say unto you love your enemies bless them that curse you do good to them that hate you and persec and pray for them with this pathfully use you and persecute you. And then finally, he says, You know what it requires to get you into the kingdom? Be therefore perfect. You want to get you into the kingdom and stay in the kingdom. You want to live everlasting life in the kingdom. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Now he wants to bring out, he's been talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. He now wants to show us their practice. Why is it their righteousness is unacceptable in the sight of God? He wants to show us why they do what they do. Their motive, their desire, their ambition, their imagination, the thing within them that colors their actions, stains their actions, defiles their actions, corrupts them so much that even the good, good things they try to do is all stained with one thing. And it's captured in that one word, hypocrisy. And as he looks at the practices of the scribes and Pharisees, he was trying to tell his own disciples. He says, you know, to get you the kingdom is the matter of the heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart. 
And there is anything that disqualifies the scribes and the Pharisees is the impurity of their heart, the impurity of their motive, the impurity of their desires. That's why now it brings it out very clearly. That brings us to Matthew chapter 6. Take heed in verse 1. That ye do not your arms before men to be seen of men, to be seen of men. Yeah, that was the whole program and project of the scribes and the Pharisees. Everything they did it was to catch man's attention. Everything they did was to be seen of men. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Disciples, believers, citizens of the kingdom, those who have a desire to get to the kingdom of God, take heed. That ye do not your arms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have, ye have no reward of your father which is in heaven. Therefore when thou doest thine arm, do not sound a trumpet before thee. As the, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. That they may have glory of men. The praise of men. That, that was their whole motive. That was their whole ambition. That was their whole dream, desire, just to have the praise and the glory of men. Very say unto you, they have their reward here on earth. They will not get to heaven. In verse 3, but when thou doest arms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doest. Don't call it party. And then say, you know, I'm doing something good. Come and watch me do it. Come and see me. The good thing, the great things I do. It says, don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That thine arms may be in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. You know what the Lord is doing? He's correcting the false interpretation. Of the required righteousness. And it's revealing the righteousness of the heart obtained by faith in Christ. Necessary if we're going to be citizens of the kingdom. In chapter 6, he's now exposing the false practice of the self-righteous scribes and Pharisees. And he's teaching us the true righteousness that pleases God, our Heavenly Father true righteousness, the righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees will only aim at doing all things only to the glory of God. Your only goal, your only ambition, your only desire is that you will find, you will seek the glory of God. The desire of the righteous is not to seek the praise of men. Examine what you do. Is it to seek the praise of men? Examine what you give. Is it to seek the recognition of men? Examine your acts and your actions. Is it to seek recognition and praise and glory and reward from men? Examine all those good, good deeds that you do. Do you do them when no eyes are watching, when no ears are listening, and when nobody is paying attention? Or do you do it to attract men's attention? Your mind is on men. Your heart is on men. Your desires are on men. And you don't think of God. God is not in your thought. If God is not in your thought, and every time you are doing something, you are wondering, do they know this? Do they recognize this? Do they see me? Do they praise me? Do they glorify me? Do they appreciate me? If that is your goal, they become your God. The people you want to impress, the people you want to attract, the people you want their praise, the people you want their recognition, they are the people you serve. The people you want their recognition. The people that I'm doing this, so and so may hear, so and so may see. That's your God. But if the God of heaven, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of the heavens and the earth, if he is your target, your goal, your focus, and he is the one you want to please, then everything you do, you say, how does God value this? How does God see this? How does God appreciate this? The only glory you seek is the glory of God. Such acts of righteousness that to seek the glory of God will begin with God, will end with God, will have God in view so that God will be your reward. And the old chapter, if you look at chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, let me show you some verses. You'll find out 
that everything focuses on God. He wants us to direct our attention and focus onto God. Look at chapter, chapter 6 and verse 4. It says that thine arms may be in secret, that thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Look at verse 6. That but thou, when thou prayest in time to thy closet, and when thou shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Look at verse 18. That thou appear not unto men to fast. But unto thy father, which is in secret, and thy father which saith in secret, shall reward thee openly. The whole concentration is on God. It says in verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Don't seek your own kingdom, your own empire, your own glory, your own ambition, your own fulfillment, your own satisfaction. But seek ye first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then it says, and all these things shall be added unto you. It is anything that disqualified the Pharisees from entering into the kingdom of God. It was that they were seeking the praise of men. The recognition of men. Look at John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, reading from verse 43. John chapter 12, reading from verse 43. Here it says... For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. You must be asking yourself now, why do you do what you do in the church? They love the praise of men more than the praise of God. What do you do what you do to your neighbors? They love the praise of men more than they love the praise of God. Why don't you do good when nobody is watching? Why don't you just send out yourself into helping people be righteous when nobody is watching? When nobody is going to mark your paper to say that is fine, that is wonderful. Why don't you do good when nobody is going to say well done? Why don't you give all your effort, all your time, all your talent, all your everything you've got, all your skill into doing something and doing it well when nobody is watching? What do you do good only when people are watching? What do you be, bring your best only when somebody is going to say, well done? Because they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Look at John chapter 5 verse 44. John chapter 5 verse 44. How can you believe which receive honor one of another? And seek not the honor that cometh from God only. How can you believe? You hear a lot. You believe a little. You study a lot. You practice a little. You hear much. But you obey little. Why? Oh, because you're seeking the praise of men. And if there's nobody to appreciate and to praise and to honor and to glorify you, then the, what's the motivation for doing something good? They don't even recognize it. That's why it says, how can you believe when you receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? The Lord wants us as righteous people, sick people, sanctified people to seek only the praise of God. Only the praise of God. Second Corinthians chapter 10. In Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Reading from verse 18. The praise of God. The recognition of God only for not he. That commendeth himself is approved. But whom the Lord commendeth. That should be our goal. We come to this study. Practical righteousness. Without hypocrisy. Practical righteousness. Without hypocrisy. We we'll divide the message the study tonight. To three parts. Number one. The caution. Number two. The condemnation. Number three. The, the compensation. Number one, caution against hypocritical righteousness. Caution against hypocritical righteousness. Number two, condemnation of hypocritical righteousness. 
those who appear to be righteous, but it's all hypocrisy. The root of their righteousness is hypocrisy. The covering on their righteousness, hypocrisy. And the very source of their righteousness is hypocrisy. There is condemnation for hypocritical righteousness. And now number three, compensation for heart righteousness. Or you might say, compensation for honesty in righteousness. Compensation for honesty in righteousness. Honest righteousness. Heart righteousness. The compensation, the reward that comes upon the people that everything they do, they seek only the glory of God. The recognition of God. All they want is to please the Lord. What a great, great compensation, commendation. And then reward will come to them. We come to number one. Caution against hypocritical righteousness. Let, let's come to this point, uh, chapter 6 of Matthew again. Matthew chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 1. Take heed that ye do not your arms before men. Take heed that ye do not your act of righteousness before men. Take heed that you do not do what you do, the good things you do, the good deeds you do. Take heed that you don't do it before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Look at verse 5. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. You see, that, that's the goal, that's the purpose, that they may be seen of men. Do you give out gifts? Why? That they may be seen of men. Why do you need to do it in such a way that they do not even know you are the one giving it? But you see the scribes and the Pharisees, that was their major goal. Human recognition. And the recognition of society, that's all they wanted. That they may be seen of men. And then it says, and very less, so they have their reward. Look at verse 16. Moreover, when, thou fast, when ye fast... Be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces. That they may appear unto men to fast. You see whether it's praying or fasting or giving arms. Doing some good deeds. All they wanted is that they wanted men to see them. Know them. Recognize them. Appreciate them. Praise them. Exalt them. Lift them up. Look at Matthew chapter 23 verse 5. Matthew 23 verse 5. But all their works, notice that, all their works they do for to be seen of men. All their works they do to be seen of men. Check up your own heart. Check up your own life. Yes, we all do good things. There's nobody here that has not done something good sometimes. But why do you do those good things? That's the question. Is it to impress people? Is it to make people say, that man is a good man you know? Is it to have recommendation? Why do you give the things you give to the people you give them? Is it because they'll be able to recommend you after they've recognized you? That's a Pharisee. That's a Sadducee. But when you're a real child of God, you do good just to do good. That's your nature. You love it. Whether people see it or not, that's your, not your concern. But you see these Pharisees, all they did, all their works they did to be seen of men. And then we're told in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 1. Luke chapter 12 verse 1. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, in so much that they trod up one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, First of all, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. What's hypocrisy? Pretense. What's hypocrisy? Eye service. 
What's hypocrisy? Professing to be who we are not. So we can have a good kind of appreciation from people. And Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Luke chapter 16 verse 15. In Luke chapter 16 verse 15 he said unto them Ye are they which justify yourselves before men and that, and that was their full time activity Everywhere they go How am I? Am I doing well? Am I nice? Let me tell you what I do I fast twice in the week I give tithes of all that I possess I don't do this, I don't do this Now, make a conclusion, tell me How am I? Am I good? That was all their project Going about to seek The recognition of men Every good thing they did They spoiled it By the hypocrisy Every good thing they did They spoiled it and they stained it And they corrupted it Because of the show It was for show It was for public recognition it was to make people say, yes, that's right. Yes, that's good. Yes, you are fine. But look at that verse 15 again. Ye are they. We justify yourselves before men. You justify yourselves before men. But God knows your heart. Didn't I tell you the art of the matter is the matter of the heart. God is looking at the heart. He's looking at your intention. Not just your action. It's looking at your motive. It's looking at the reason you do what you do. And if your motive is wrong, if your motivation is wrong, if your desires are wrong, if the source of the action is wrong, if the internal source is wrong, whatever comes out, whatever it is, is going to be wrong in the sight of God. God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And let me show you an example. Second Kings chapter 10. Second Kings chapter 10. And we're looking at verse 16. Then I'll jump down to verse 31. Second Kings chapter 10 verse 16. And he said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. You can tell. He wanted somebody to come and see. It's like, actually, the word hypocrisy is uh, taken from the theater arts of those days. The people that were just actors in the theater. And then the spectators will come. You tell me, all those uh, people that act in the theater, what if there were no spectators? They will not do what they do. All those people that play games on the, on, on the field. I think about football or what they call soccer in other places. And then you have all this team on. And then look at all the seats around the stadium. And what they were expecting about 50,000, about, uh, about uh, maybe about 60,000 in the stadium. And you only have a sprinkling of people. You have about 20 people sitting on there. They will not play. They will, not, they will not put all their energy and all their skill into what they're doing because they look around the stadium and see they have only 20 people instead of the 50,000 people that should come and watch them. And therefore, they will not give their best because they are actors. And that's they're from the world, from the Greek, it was taken from hypocrisy, is taken from that, that the people, they just want you to watch them. They want you to see them. They want you to recognize them. And, every, and if you don't recognize them, they either get angry. If you don't watch them and glue your eyes on them and show that and, and be smiling and be clapping, applauding them, then they, they get discouraged like actors, hypocrites, hypocrisy. And then you find Jehu here, he is telling another person, he said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. But look at verse 31. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord, of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. It was only for show, only for demonstration, only for the theater, only for drama. It wasn't for real. 
That's the problem of the hypocrites. That's the problem of the people that do not have a sincere heart to follow the Lord. For he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. And uh, that, that's the problem of many people today. Because there's no genuine salvation. Because there's no genuine conversion. And because there's no genuine heart experience of holiness and sanctification. Therefore, everything is just, you know, to impress people. Isaiah chapter 29, I'm reading from verse 13. Isaiah 29. And I'm reading to you from verse 13. It says, wherefore the Lord said, For as much as these people draw near to me, they draw near to me with their mouth. And with their lips do they honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. You see what God is looking for? He's looking for the heart. It's not just your lips. It's not just your mouth. It's not just your words. That's just empty air coming out of you. If the heart is not there, if your mind is not there, if your inward devotion is not there, if it's all just words, that's what God said, these people draw near unto me. With their mouth and with their lips do they honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among these people. Even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish. And the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Warn to them. They seek to hide their counsel from the Lord. They seek to hide their real intention. Their real purpose. Their real goal. Their real ambition. They seek to hide it from the Lord. Well, then the Lord is cautioning us that our motive and desire to be seen of men and to be praised by men spoils everything we do. Merely being seen of men is not the issue. People can see you, but if that's not your intention, if that's not your desire, you can still go ahead and do what you need to do. There is no reward from God for those who seek the praise and the recognition of men. Take that, understand that. Everything you do to the preaching of the gospel and the praying in the church and outside the church. And the giving things to people to help them. And the philanthropic work that you do. The generosity of your life. If it is to seek the praise of men, they will see how nice I am. How good I am. How competent I am. How generous I am. How philanthropic I am. I give to the good of the society. If that's all you want, that they recognize you. It has no recognition by God. God knows all things. He does not only see the actions of men. He sees the motives and the desires too. That's why we're told that nothing is hidden from the eyes of the Lord. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And therefore he wants us to, uh, to think about what to do. We can, only be, we can only judge and examine our own hearts and make sure that our motives, our desires are right and acceptable before the Lord. Look at Mark chapter 7 verse 6. Mark chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 6. And you'll see what the Lord is emphasizing. Mark chapter 7, reading from verse 6. It says, He answered and said unto them, Well, as Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. And to start with, do you see how direct the Lord Jesus was? Why was he so direct? He wasn't seeking the praise of men. You know, as a preacher, if you're seeking the praise of the people you're preaching to, you'll say what they want to hear. Who wants to hear that he's a hypocrite? And the Pharisees didn't want to hear, of course, that Jesus will tell them, you're hypocrites. Nobody wants to hear that. And when you don't say what people don't want to hear, uh, number one, that's the fear of man. Number two, you, you, don't, you don't value their soul. You're not telling them the truth that will help them to reshape and to return 
and to repent and to be converted. You only want to just make them happy now. Which means yourself, the preacher, you're seeking the praise of men. You cannot tell the person, look at this. This is wrong. And this is going to lead you to everlasting bodies in the lake of fire. But Jesus Christ, he wasn't seeking their praise. If he wanted their praise, he wouldn't talk the way he was talking. That's why he said, well, as has spoken of you, hypocrites. As it is written, these people honoreth me with their leaves. But their heart is far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold the traditions of men. As the washing of the pots and the cups and many other such things, such like things ye do. I pray God will deliver us from hypocrisy. Give me a good day. Amen. We come to point number three now, the condemnation. This is serious. Contem condemnation of hypocritical righteousness. Uh, you know, when, when somebody says he has righteousness, uh, you need to find out what kind of righteousness. There's self-righteousness. There's hypocritical righteousness. But there is righteousness of faith. That you recognize you are a sinner. And that no matter what you do, by the deeds of your hand and by the deeds of the Lord, can no man be justified. And you feel condemned in the sight of the Lord. And you say, All my righteousness, they like feel the rags. And therefore, I come to you, Lord, you are the only righteous one. And you turn away from your sin. And you look at the blood of Jesus by faith flowing from Calvary to cleanse you, to put you, and to wash you. And then to wash all your sins away, to turn you you around and make you a righteous person that righteousness that comes from god as a gift and now you're able to live a righteous life that's the righteousness that counts the righteousness that matters but the people that hold on to self-righteousness the people that hold on to hypocritical righteousness that righteousness will not see you through to the gates of heaven only lead you to the, to the depths of hell. In Matthew chapter 6, I'm looking at verse 2. Matthew chapter 6, verse 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine arms, do not sound a trumpet before thee. You wonder, why would they sound a trumpet before them? If you go back to the Old Testament, uh, don't open, I'll just tell you. In Numbers chapter 10, verses 1 to 4, whenever the children of Israel wanted to gather people together, they put a trumpet to their mouth, and then they blow. If they blow once, it look, they, they're looking about the kind of congregation they want. If they blow twice, then it's another kind of attention they want. If they blow three times, then it's another kind of audience they want. And these Pharisees, it, so to say, they'll put a trumpet in their mouth. They'll stand at the corner of a street. And then they'll be at the corner of a synagogue. And then they'll blow the trumpet. And all the Israelites realize, whenever you blow the trumpet like that, you want people to gather. And then the people will gather. If they didn't have enough crowd to see what they were going to do, they'll blow the trumpet again. That's where we get the, uh, where we get the uh, phrase or the, or, the, or the proverb that you do not blow your own trumpet. It's not talking of this literal, literal prophet, uh, trumpets here. It's talking about calling attention to yourself, talking about your good deeds, and attracting the glory and the praise of men. Don't blow your own trumpets. That's why we got that. And in this Matthew chapter 6, it says, Thou, when thou doest arms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. I were told in Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 6. Everybody's speaking of themselves, blowing their own trumpets. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. That's blowing your trumpet. I'm good. I'm great. I'm generous. I do this, I do that. Didn't you hear? Uh, the one that, you know, helped the other fellow. I'm the one that gave them the clothes they are wearing. 
Oh, you know, when so and so is passing by, look at the shoes in his feet. I'm the one that bought that for him. Everyone, will, it says, will proclaim his goodness, but a faithful man who can find. And the Lord is telling us not to do that, not to seek your own glory. Philippians chapter 2, verse 21. Philippians chapter 2, verse 21. For all seek their own. All seek their own. And not the things which are Jesus Christ's. As a mark, they were not born again. And as a mark, you are not born again. If all you're seeking is recognition, is the glory of men, is the praise of men. How do we know you're seeking the praise of men? Because whenever the praise does not come, you get angry. You get frustrated. Whenever people do not glorify you, appreciate you, lift you up, exalt you, whenever the praise you are looking for does not come, you get discouraged and frustrated and unhappy. And that's why it says, for all seek their own and not the things which are Jesus Christ's. And let's look at Jeremiah. What Jeremiah is telling us in chapter 45. Verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 45 verse 5. And seekest thou great things for thyself? Are you seeking great recognition? Great attention? Praise for yourself. Seek them not. Seek them not. You see, if you do that, it means that really you are not interested in the Lord. All you are interested in will just be that, you know, I want people to recognize me. And if you look at your notes, it says, hypocrisy stains and corrupts and destroys every good thing it touches. Hypocrisy turns, I'm giving to fill the rags. Hypocrisy turns your praying, your fasting into fill the rags. Hypocrisy turns your good works and your supposed love into fill the rags. Hypocrisy turns your righteousness and holiness, zeal, consecration into fill the rags. Any good things you think you have, any good quality you think you have, any good action you think you project, hypocrisy turns everything into fill the rags. By the way, what's hypocrisy? What's hypocrisy? And let's look at Matthew chapter 23 verse 14. You'll see a word there that describes hypocrisy. Matthew chapter 23 verse 14. One to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye devour widows' houses and for ye pretense. That's the word. For a pretense, make long prayer. Hypocrisy and pretense, they are the same. For a person pretending, that's hypocrisy. Look at verse 28. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Hypocrisy is iniquity. Where well, you hide a bad thing inside, a negative thing inside. A corrupting inside. And then you polish the outside to make people think you're righteous, you're good. That's hypocrisy. And let's look at Matthew chapter 23 verse 5. In verse 5 it says, For all their works do they do to be seen of men. That's hypocrisy. When everything you do, you'll wait on the people can see you before you do it. There is a need. You will not meet that need if nobody will know. They must know the person that is doing well, that is doing good, the fellow that is responsible for helping people. If nobody will, know, will not know, you will not do it. That's hypocrisy. It's only when people gather and they will see it. And they will know it. And they will know, I am the one doing this great good thing. Then, as the, then you jump into action. That's hypocrisy. In that same Matthew chapter 23, verse 23 unto you. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. When you major in the minor, when you concentrate on little, little, little things, and then the weightier matters you overlook. 
And you know, there are people that you know, they're very meticulous about wearing a scarf. That's all right to wear a scarf. But when you concentrate on, I put on my scarf, but there's anger in your heart. And you don't deal with that. Which one is more serious? There's no love in the heart. There's no salvation in the heart. And all you just carry about is, I wear a scarf. I cannot go out without my scarf. <laughs> Good luck to you. You major in the minor. That's hypocrisy. That's why Jesus said, want to use scribes and Pharisees. Because you pay tithes of an anis. It's even little, little vegetable. They'll pay tithes. But then you meet the weightier matters of the Lord. Judgment and mercy and faith. When you meet those weightier things, those important things, you don't care about the weighty things, the important things, and then the minor, minor things about physical appearance, where you put the whole weight of Christianity. That's hypocrisy. Hey, look at verse 25. One to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within ye are full of extortion and excess. When the outward is polished and clean, because that's what people will see. Your relationship outside, you take care of that very well. But inside in your house with your wife and your children, with your, with your husband and your children, you're like a lion. It's hard to live with you. But outside, you smile, you look nice, you are great in human relations on the outside. That's hypocrisy. When you polish the outside, and everything looks nice on the outside, but inwardly ravening wolves. That's hypocrisy. And now in verse 27, want to use scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye are like unto white sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward. Which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within, full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. That's hypocrisy. It tells us in, in, Mark, in Mark, chapter, Mark chapter 12. I need to show you something here. Mark chapter 12. I'm reading to you from verse 13 to verse 15. Mark chapter 12. Verse 13. And he sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. To catch him in his words. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, isn't that hypocrisy? When they gave honor to the Lord, and yet they only came to tempt him. That's hypocrisy. When you say you, you're seeking for advice, but you're trying to put the advice out, the counselor into trouble. Your real intention is to get him into trouble. But you say, Master, I come to seek some advice from you. What should we do? That's hypocrisy. Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man. That's the truth. Jesus was the truth. And he cared for no man. For thou regardest not the person of men. That's true. And teachest the way of God in truth. That's the truth. You know you can say the truth. But if your heart is not right, you're still an hypocrite. Because you see, all, the, all that these people said, everything was true. They called him master. Yes, he was master. We know that thou art true. That's the truth. And cares for no man. You have no respect for. You, have, you are not a respecter of persons. You are not a partial person. A partial teacher. Yes, that was the truth. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Every word they said, there was no lie there. And yet, they were still hypocritical. Everything you say may be true. It depends on the motive for saying it. The condition of your heart for saying it. Then they said, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? Verse 15. But he, knowing their hypocrisy you see that that's hypocrisy even though what you said was the truth with a wrong heart with a wrong motive 
with a wrong intention. That's hypocrisy. And look at First Timothy chapter 4. People can tell the truth and say be hypocritical. They can tell lies also and be hypocritical. First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. You cannot really get yourself into hypocrisy until you depart from the faith. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy. That's another branch of hypocrisy. Some people can tell the truth and say the truth, but they have hypocritical minds. They have a wrong intention. That's hypocrisy. Other people will tell lies. And the lie is in hypocrisy because it's just speaking lies in hypocrisy. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Actually, when people are hypocritical, they don't listen to their conscience. They silence their consciences. They dead in their consciences. And the voice of the spirit, they dead in. They say, no, don't speak to me. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyhow. I need to get the attention of these people. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their consciences seared with a hot iron. And let's come to Matthew now, chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. What's the end of these hypocrites? Uh, what's the effect, the impact of hypocrites in the lives of other people? Matthew 23 verse 13. One to you. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. That's the effect, the influence, the impact of hypocrites. They do not, they do not enter the kingdom of God and they hinder other people from getting to the kingdom of God. Have you sometimes preached to people and you say, come, let's go to church together. Oh, they say, no. Apart from the church a long time There's so many hypocrites in the church I don't want to get myself involved in going to church anymore Too many hypocrites there You say but I go to a different kind of church I go to a Pentecostal church And it says They are even worse than the historic churches They are even worse than the nominal churches and they cover up a lot with the speaking in tongues. And it's, it's those people, I don't want to have anything to do with any church. Too much hypocrisy in those churches. And when people see you, isn't that what they say? They, where you live, in your community. And you say you are deep alive. And see how you are acting. Anyway, we know that these are the last days. Hypocrisy, everybody goes to church now. And you look at what you do. They tell you to your face. And that means then you are not getting to the kingdom of God. And the people that ought to enter into the kingdom of God, you do not allow them. You do not encourage them. You discourage them to enter the kingdom of God by your action. Look at verse 14. One to you. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Pretense in praying. In the house of God. Praying, but not with sincerity. Praying to attract attention. Either shouting, and you're seeing the fellow, you say, this man is spiritual. See the way he's praying, it's all hypocrisy. Or sometimes, with the gesticulation, the action, and the fellow is praying and sweating. But you know, when he's in his house, he doesn't pray like that. It's only when it is to attract attention. That's hypocrisy. And then it says in verse 14, Therefore ye shall receive the greater condemnation. Great condemnation, greater condemnation. One to ye in verse 15, Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. You'll think that when people do evangelism, you'll think it's because they're serious and they love the Lord. There are some people that do the evangelism and it is for hypocrisy. It says, and, and when he's made a convert, a proselyte, ye make him twofold, more ch the child of hell than yourself. That's why it says in verse 33 Ye serpents and ye generation of vipers How can ye escape the damnation of hell The hypocrisy shall not escape I pray God will help every one of us
You know, this hypocrisy we're talking about. Let me show you Job chapter 13. Job chapter 13. The judgment that comes upon hypocrites. The perdition. The curse and the wrath of God upon the hypocrites. Condemnation of hypocritical righteousness. We're looking at Job chapter 13. In Job chapter 13, verse 16. He also shall be my salvation. For an hypocrite shall not come before him. An hypocrite shall not come before the almighty God. No, never. In Job chapter 8. Job chapter 8 verse 13. So are the parts of all that forget God. The hypocrite's hope shall perish. The hope of hypocrites shall perish. Job chapter 15 verse 34. Job 15 verse 34. For the congregation of hypocrites shall be desolate. And fire shall consume the tabernacles of bribery. It says the congregation of hypocrites. You see, how can a whole congregation be hypocritical? The congregation of Pharisees, the whole congregation, they were hypocrites. The congregation of the scribes, all of them. All the members of the Sanhedrin, the leadership. The Sanhedrin, that's the leadership of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. All of them were hypocrites. They knew that Jesus was the truth. That's why they came and he said, Master, we know, we know that thou art true. Thou teachest the way of God in truth. Why then did they not believe? They were hypocrites. Nicodemus came and he said, Master, we know, Rabbi, we know. Thou art a teacher come from God. We know it. Why are you hiding in them, scribes and Pharisees? Because they were hypocrites. A whole congregation, the congregation of hypocrites. And it says, there's judgment of God upon them. Look at that again, verse 34, Job chapter 15. For the congregation of hypocrites shall be desolate, and fire shall consume the tabernacles of bribery. Job chapter 27, verse 8. Job 27, I'm reading from verse 8. For what is the hope? Of the hypocrite, though he has gained when God taketh away his soul. You see that? God shall take away the soul of the hypocrite. What a terrible thing. In Job chapter 36. Job chapter 36. I'm reading from verse 13. 36, 13. But the hypocrite's in heart, hip hop, wrath. The hypocrites in heart. Hip hop, wrath. Check up your heart. Check up your heart. Are you sincere? Are you honest? Are you faithful? Is your heart drawn towards God and God alone? Are you seeking to please God and God alone? Or is there hypocrisy in your heart? That's what it says here. It says very clearly, but the hypocrites in heart, hypocrites, they cry not when he bindeth them. Even when God corrects them, chastises them, they don't budge. That's hypocrisy. Or they know God is talking to them and they say, if I budge, if I repent, if I act, then the people will know. I've not been sincere all this time because of that. They keep, in, they keep their error. Because of that, they keep their evil. Because of that, they keep on doing the evil they want to do. Because they say, you know, if I change, then everybody will know I've not been right before. The height of hypocrisy. Our great judgment, perdition and wrath, indignation of God comes upon them. In Isaiah chapter 33, I'm reading from verse 14. Isaiah chapter 33 verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. They ought to be afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Because judgment is coming. Who among God shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings. And you see the, the lot of the hypocrite. The final edge of the hypocrites. Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 51. Matthew 24. Reading from verse 51. Terrible scene. The terrible edge of the hypocrite. Matthew chapter 24 verse 51. 
and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, it's unfortunate when you have hypocrites. And they listen to all the messages like Judas Iscariot. Every message Jesus gave, all that we're reading today, Judas was there. And he still kept his hypocrisy. Because Judas Iscariot was the greatest hypocrite of all times. He pretended to care for the poor. And he pretended his heart was you know, following after the Lord. And yet his heart was not right with Christ. Do you remember the story of Absalom? Absalom was a great hypocrite. He professed devotion to God while there was some precedented wickedness in his heart. Both Absalom and Judas Iscariot had outward expressions of being good. You know, when Jesus said, one of you will betray me, none of the disciples suspected it could be Judas Iscariot. That man was a nice man, outwardly. He carried the bag. And he appeared to be faithful and honest. But Judas Iscariot, only Jesus knew what a great hypocrite he was. And Absalom... Absalom, when people came and they came to see the king and the, fe and the fellow will prostrate and get up. I mean, man like you are, what's your problem? Very nice and very gentle and the voice was soothing. And then he will say, you know, if there was somebody deputed to the king, he would have looked at your matter and I would have looked at this, but the king is just, is having a one man show. Can you think of a king with no deputy? Can you think of a king with no assistant? And then he points in the minds of the people. He stole their hearts away. And then when he now came up, he then went to the, his father. He said, Daddy, you know, you think that everybody's saying Daddy is honest? You think everybody's saying Daddy is a child of God? Daddy, I, I made a vow to the Lord when I was on that other side. And I want to go and fulfill my vow. And David said, my son, go, go in peace. And then he gathered all the people together. And then they told David, Absalom, reigns. And David had to run away. This man was so gentle, was so nice, but was a great hypocrite. And that right now, their condemnation is known to the whole world. I mean, Jesus is Carrot and Absalom. And their damnation continues until eternity. I pray God will deliver every one of us. Now we come to point number three. Point number three, compensation for heart righteousness. Compensation for honesty in righteousness. That anything you do, everything you do, you're seeking the glory and the praise of God alone. We're looking at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 verses 3 and 4. Matthew chapter 6 verses 3 and 4. But when thou doest arms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Don't publicize it. Don't proclaim it to people. Don't praise yourself. Don't seek the glory of men. Just do it as unto the Lord. When thou doest arms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. What's the meaning of this? Do you see how close the left hand and the right hand are? And yet he says, let not the closest person know. As much as possible, do it as unto the Lord. And you're not doing it for show. You're not doing it for, like in the theater, to dramatize and to show people how great, how good, how godly I am. And then in verse 4, it says that thine arms may be in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. That's telling us that you do it unto the Lord alone. We're looking at Colossians chapter 3 verse 23. Colossians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 23 and verse 24. And whatsoever ye do, whatsoever ye do in that day, any time, Whatsoever ye do, whatever season of the year, whatsoever ye do, at home or in church. Whatsoever ye do, to friends or to enemies. You know, I love my enemies now. And then I'm, I'm giving this, you know, yesterday, look at what I gave to my enemy. Ah, because of the Bible study where the other time, I have changed. I gave this to my enemy. Whatsoever ye do, 
do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Don't publicize it. Don't exalt yourself. Don't make a public proclamation about it. Do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. Let your heart be centered on the Lord alone. And let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we're reading from verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, ye do to we, we, uh, ye do, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounds unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record ye, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. Can the Lord say that about you? To your skill, beyond your skill. To the limit of, of your ability. Beyond the limit of, of your ability. That you just give yourself to God. You, you are sold out. In serving the Lord. And serving the people of God. With no ulterior motive. With no selfish desire. With no hypocritical ambition. You are not doing that to pave ways. So they can promote me. So they can give me this chance or that chance. You're not covering up anything. You know some people, when they're looking for something, how they cover up. And they're not sincere. It's after they have got the position. We're beginning to hear some stories about them. And then we'll say, come on here. We're hearing this and this and that. Yes, that is true. I'm sorry about that. Why didn't you tell us? Before we put you in this position, he covered it up deliberately. Because all he wanted was the praise of men. All he wanted was the position. There will be no blessing in that position. But you know, when you go beyond everything you've got, and you consecrate yourself to the Lord, for the, to their power, I bear record here, beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty, that we would receive the gift, and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry, to the saints, and this they did not as we hoped, but first they gave their own selves to the Lord. First, you give your heart, your mind, your soul, your motive, your intention, everything you've got, you give to the Lord before you give that other thing. Because all that you're seeking for is the will of God. And then it says unto us, by the will of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 9. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 9. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness remaineth forever. Not temporary righteousness. Just when people are there. But when people are not there. His righteousness with all sincerity. With all honesty. His righteousness remaineth forever. Psalm 112. Psalm 1, 1, 2. I'm reading from verse 1. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. And his righteousness endureth forever. His righteousness endureth forever. Not something temporary. Not something demonstrated only when people can see. It's righteousness. Whether people are there or they're not there. Whether people recognize or they don't recognize. Whether people praise or blame. The righteousness is a constant sin. And it says his righteousness endureth forever unto the upright. There arises light in the darkness. He is gracious. He is full of compassion and righteous. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He guideth his affairs with discretion. Surely it shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. The Lord will remember him. The righteous. 
shall be in everlasting remembrance. The angels will remember him. And the saints who have gone on to glory, they will remember him. Because his righteousness was deep and sincere. His righteousness was built on the foundation of salvation. Real, genuine salvation. Conversion. And whether people know or not, that's just him. In the midst of variables, he is constant. Listen to that again. In the midst of variables, he is constant. He is constantly pursuing righteousness and holiness and purity. Whatever people think, whatever people say, whether people recognize or they do not recognize, is righteousness endure it forever. And that's the kind of righteousness that God is going to appreciate. Well, the mind and the heart that wants to please God all the time. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is fixed. Praise him or blame him. Persecute him or appreciate him. His heart is fixed. In the rainy season, the dry season, his heart is fixed. This is the way I'm going to walk in it. And when people do not agree, because, you know, when people do not agree with you, if you were serving men and you were looking for the praise of men, you'll change. You'll say, now, this is good, this is not appreciated. People being honest and being righteous, people don't appreciate that today. Therefore, I seek, I have to change because they are your God. But if God is your God... And you want to just please God, whatever men do, whatever men say, his heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he sees desire upon his enemies. He has dispersed and he has given to the poor his righteousness and endureth forever. And his horn shall be exalted with honor. And then we look at Psalm 37 verse 29. Psalm 37 we're looking at Psalm 37, reading from verse 29. And this is talking about the righteous, the people that do not have hypocrisy mix of their righteousness. Psalm 37, reading from verse 29. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart. The law of his God is in his heart. He's not looking for the praise of men. All he wants is just to fulfill the law of the Lord. And the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Any blessing for such people? Of course, of course. Great, great blessings for them. Isaiah chapter 3 verse 10. Isaiah chapter 3. We're looking at verse 10. It tells us, say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, the righteous. No hypocrisy in his righteousness, say unto him, it shall be well with him. No pretense in his righteousness, no lip service, no eye service in his righteousness. It's righteous through and through. Doing everything as unto the Lord. Say unto such a righteous man, it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. I about the wicked, I about the hypocritical, I about the people that even the good things they try to do, hypocrisy will stain and define and corrupt everything. Look at verse 11. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. And it's not only in this world, but in the world to come. Because the hypocrite shall suffer condemnation and suffer uh, the wrath of God in eternity. And now you're asking yourself, how hey, about your own righteousness? Is it something that is pleasing to the Lord? Are you having the mind of just pleasing the Lord or you have another intention, another motive? In Galatians chapter 1, I'm reading to you from verse 10. Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? In your action, you try to persuade men. 
in your behavior? Are you trying to persuade men, convince them that you are good? Or is God your focus? Do I now seek to persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? You know, that's what hypocrites do. Just to please men. Even when they know that they are not in the right attitude and mood. All they just want to do is to please men. Then it says in that verse 10, For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. If I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. First Thessalonians, I'm reading to you from chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 1. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you that by the Lord Jesus, that she have, that, that as ye have received us, how ye ought to walk and please God, so ye would abound more and more. Ye ought to walk to please God. Pleasing God, and that's what, that's what matters. Pleasing men, that doesn't matter. In fact, that's going to lead you into hypocrisy. And if you're going to get to heaven at last, pleasing God is what the Lord wants us to do. All the time, doing everything else unto the Lord. Hebrews chapter 11 verse, verse 5. Hebrews 11, I'm reading to you from verse 5. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And was not found because God has translated, has translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. He had this testimony that he pleased God. That's what the Lord is looking for in our lives, in our heart, in our action. Everything that we do, that we do everything, whether you pray or you fast or you give alms or you are generous or whatever it is you do, that you do not allow hypocrisy to be mixed with it. The hypocrites will spend eternity in hellfire. But the people are holy and righteous without hypocrisy, without insincerity and without any pretense. They are the people that will be with the Lord forever and ever. That's our hope. And I pray that that hope will be yours in Jesus' name. We're told in 1 John chapter 3 verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. The world knoweth us not. We're not doing anything to please the world. Or to attract the praise or the attention of the world. Therefore the world knoweth us not. Then it says, eh, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. We shall see him. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. Even as he is pure. Everyone that has this hope of seeing the Lord on the final day, of getting to heaven, will purify himself from all forms of hypocrisy, even as Christ is pure. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That what we have learned today will become a part of our experience, a part of our lives, a part of the holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That this will become a part of our action, a part of everything we are, everything that we do to be righteous, to be holy, to be pure, without hypocrisy, without the intention of wanting to attract the praise of men, of wanting to please men. All you want to do is to seek the glory of God in everything you do. Talk to the Lord in prayer. If you're a sinner, you call upon the Lord so you can be saved. Tell him to forgive your sin. Tell him, even there, the things that appear good that you have done, you know the hypocrisy mix of that. You know the praise of men you're seeking. And now you're telling the Lord, oh Lord, I'm sorry. Even those righteous acts, and I feel the rags, feel the rags. They'll not qualify you for heaven, but you are telling the Lord, oh Lord, I want your salvation. I want your salvation. I want to be really converted. I want the cleansing of my heart. And all this hypocrisy in my life, all the lip service and the eye service, and all the pretense. So Lord, take it away from me. I want to live a pure life, a, a righteous life. Give me the righteousness that comes from the very throne of God. Cleanse all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. If you are a backslider, 
And the little good you try to do today, you're only seeking the praise of men. You're only seeking the attention of men. And when men are not there, you just give yourself to iniquity and sin. But now you are telling the Lord, oh Lord, I'm so sorry about that. That my life now is just to attract men and women. It's to impress people. Everything you do, to impress people. Whether it's wedding, to impress people. Even the funeral is to impress people. Even the, the good, good things you appear to do in the service of God is to impress people. Hypocrisy. As a backslider, you come to the Lord and say, Lord, I am sorry. The hypocrite shall dwell in everlasting bornings in the lake of fire for eternity. Oh Lord, I want to die a hypocrite. Pretending to be what I am not. Oh Lord, I come to you. Cleanse me and wash me from all hypocrisy. Are you hypocritical in the service of the Lord? In prayer, are you hypocritical? In doing good, are you hypocritical? In giving testimony in the church, are you hypocritical? The things you say, the people you're trying to impress, are you trying to please people talking high about yourself? Are you hypocritical? Why don't you tell the Lord, oh Lord, I am sorry. I want you to cleanse me. I want you to wash me. I want you to change every direction of my life. All this hypocrisy, oh Lord, take it away from me. For all men seek their own. Are you trying to seek your own advantage? Your own interest? What are you seeking? Why do you do what you do? You tell the Lord to forgive you. Hypocrisy is bad outside. Hypocrisy is worse in the presence of God. When you claim to be a child of God and then you have the actions of Satan, that's terrible. But you come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Cleanse me and wash me, change me, turn me around. Let my life be totally different. You remember Ananas and Sapphira? Hypocrisy in the presence of God. Hypocrisy in the house of God. They went to hell unprepared. They went to eternity unprepared. They died suddenly because of the hypocrisy, pretense in the house of God. In the presence of God, trying to offer, trying to give. And then pretending they were giving more than they had given. Hypocrisy. And the Lord is saying, when you give things to people, let not your left hand know what your right hand doeth. Be sincere. Be honest. Be spiritual. Don't seek the praise of men. Don't seek the glory of men. Are you only happy when men praise you? Are you only happy when men recognize what you do? Are you doing what you do? You are doing it well only when you are recognized? When you are praised? When you are appreciated? Are you doing it as unto the Lord? Appreciated or not appreciated? Pray, praised or not praised? Are you seeking the glory of God alone? Seeking the glory of God alone. Tell the Lord, Lord, turn me around. Lord, change all my action, my motive, my intention, my desires. Change everything that my heart will be to you. My mind will be to you. My intention will be centered on you. My motive will be centered on you. You tell the Lord. That's the glory of the Christian life. The beauty of the Christian life. You are not like white sepulchers. Only beautiful on the outside. 
but corrupt, evil, dirty, stinking on the inside. Inward purity and outward purity. You are not a lady just concentrating on the minor. I don't wear trusses as a lady. Uh -uh. That's all your Christianity. I put on scarf every time I'm going. That's your Christianity. Majoring on the minor. And overlooking the mighty weightier things of the word of God. The justice and the mercy and the faith and the love and the kindness. Concentrate on the major things. And let your heart be yielded to the Lord. And purge out all that hypocrisy from your heart, from your life. So that the Lord will know you just want to live a life pleasing unto him. You want to be like Enoch. Saved. Sanctified. Righteous. Holy. Purged. Purified. Blessed are the pure in heart. Not the hypocritical in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. All our hearts must appear. Purified from every form of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy in your action. Hypocrisy in your attitude. Hypocrisy in your behavior. Purged. Cleansed from hypocrisy. Living a life to the glory of God. Having an assurance of salvation. The spirit of God bearing witness with your spirit, with your heart. You are a true child of God. Your heart is purified. Your life is purified. Your character, your behavior is purified. Your intention, your purpose, your goal, your desire. In everything you do. Oh Lord, I'm doing this unto you. Oh Lord, I'm doing this unto you. And man will not be the focus of your action. The almighty God will be the reason for doing what you do. Is the beginning, is the end of everything you do. His glory is your goal. Pleasing Him is your desire. Everything is offered unto Him. You don't really care what people think about you, what people say about you. You're not going out of your way to seek the favor of men or the praise of men. All you want is, Lord, does this please you? Do you appreciate this? Is this what you want of me? That's what counts. So the Lord will give you a genuine experience. A biblical experience of righteousness. A biblical experience of salvation and conversion. A biblical experience of sanctification and holiness. Holiness of heart. Holiness without hypocrisy. 